Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. President Trump is facing several investigations, from his actions on January 6th to try to overturn the 2020 election, to his alleged mishandling of classified documents after he left the White House. On August 8th, the FBI executed a raid on Trump's residence at Mar-a-Lago as part of the investigation into the documents. We don't have all the details yet, but some reporting suggests that Trump was storing top-secret documents related to national defense in violation of laws meant to protect such material. To critics of Trump, this was yet another example of his flagrant disregard for the law. Trump, they believe, presents a unique threat to our democracy, and they hope that the investigations will prevent him from ever setting foot in the Oval Office again. For Trump supporters, however, the FBI raid presented further evidence that the current administration will do anything they can to take Trump down, even if it means politicizing law enforcement and holding Trump to a standard they would never apply to any other president. Regardless of how you feel about the investigations, it's clear that the country is more divided than ever when it comes to President Trump and his future as a political leader. Here at Braver Angels, we receive lots of feedback from members about the FBI raid. Some praised the government for following the law. Others called the whole thing a sham and called for the FBI to be defunded. As these investigations proceed, we'll be chatting with Americans across the political spectrum. In a future episode, I'll be speaking with Democrats about their thoughts on the raid, the investigations, and the upcoming midterm elections. But today my guest is Wilk Wilkinson, a strong Trump supporter and a leader at Braver Angels' We the People's Project. And he's here to represent the views of millions of Americans on the right who reacted to the raid with anger and disgust. Wilk, welcome to the podcast. What was your reaction when you learned about the FBI raid? Here we go again. (laughs) That's uh, I mean, really, that's that's what it's all about right now is is here we go again. What are are they going to do this time? And uh, it's you know, it's it's getting to the point where it's it's just so mundane. These these attacks that and that's that's what they seem like to me. And I think they seem like that to a lot of people. It's just personal attacks right now on somebody that they've been doing everything that they could do for several years now to to get. They're out to get him, and and that's kind of what it seems like to me. And what's your reaction to the argument that some on the left make, which is that fundamentally nobody is above the law, and that includes a former president, And if there is evidence that the former president violated a law by refusing to turn over classified information that no longer belongs to him, it belongs to the people of the United States. And there's some reporting to suggest that the federal investigators originally tried to ask Trump nicely to turn over these documents uh, which apparently included a famous letter that Kim Jong Un wrote President Trump, and uh, I'm sure he, you know, maybe liked to show it off to to guests at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, wouldn't surprise me given Trump's flair for performance and all that. But I do think there's also a a serious side of this, right? If if there are classified documents that relate to national security, I could see why. It could be a real problem uh, for for President Trump to have them at at Mar-a-Lago. What what's your reaction to that argument that folks make? Oh, I think I would agree with the fact that nobody's above the law. I, I think, um, as an American citizen, as you know, somebody who believes in the rule of law, I think that most people would agree nobody's above the law. But it's just a matter of what we deem as against the law or what laws were broken um when we look at this particular event uh this you know thing with the presidential records act and 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 things like that at no time in american history have we ever seen the home or residence of a former president 
rated in the way that it was done here. And so, so the reality is yes, absolutely. Nobody's above the law. And were there documents taken that shouldn't have been taken? That remains to be seen. I, I, I think it's possible. I think it's probably possible in most presidencies that, that things were taken that should not have been taken. I'm not going to defend Trump because I don't know what documents were taken. I don't know what was found in this raid earlier this week. And and sh certainly, if there were things that were taken that he should not have had, and he was asked to voluntarily give up and then did not, you know, that's what the that's what the investigations for. That's that's what the you know the case to be made will be. Uh, what we do know, though, is is it's pretty unprecedented to see what we saw there, and it's uh, it's pretty disturbing. Hmm. Do you think this helps President Trump's position politically? Because I feel like when President Trump really thrives and seems at his most confident is when he's able to, for lack of a better term, play the victim. And he has a foil and he's able to project a sense of grievance and a, a sense that he has been wronged by people who are holding him to a double standard. And to me, this presents another opportunity for him to do this because he can point to this unprecedented action. And I think he can tap into beliefs that a lot of his supporters hold that the left, the powers that be, want to do what they can to prevent him from regaining office. How do you see that? Well, based on the uh, what I've seen over the last 24 to 48 hours in, in the reports of his fundraising and, and things going absolutely through the roof, I would say you're absolutely right. It does help him. It, it does help him because uh, well, and just just in some personal forums that I've I've read and, and looked at this week, I've also seen people who, by by all intents, were were for the most part done with Trump. We're kind of like, okay, let's let's move beyond this. Let's see where we're going. You know, let's see where we can go now in the post-Trump era uh, with the Republican Party. But now that they've seen this, they're back on they're back on the train. I mean, they are saying, you know what, we're sick and tired of the federal government and the powers that be weaponizing federal agencies to go after their political opponents. You know, what we have to do is we have to remember how this whole thing with Trump got started in the first place. You know, during the Obama era with the... Um, the weaponizing of the IRS and going after Tea Party Republicans and, and things like that. That's what really started this thing that has now become a, just a, a leviathan, really, um, with, with Trump publicans, <laughs> you know, for, for lack of a better way of saying it. People got really tired of the federal government coming in, swooping in, using federal agencies as their, you know, personal um, personal vendetta enforcement agencies. And that's how we got Trump in the first place. And, and the way that, you know, I, I mean, you do make a good point. Trump does better than many take that and take those events and use them to his advantage because he's, that's way that's his style. He's a showman. He knows how to seize on opportunities. And this is not going to be any exception. He's going to do it and it's going to work. It's going to work for him. Hmm. I'm curious to get your thoughts too on some of the other investigations into Trump, some of which to me seem like they might be a little bit more serious. I mentioned earlier the one that really sticks out to me was that call where Donald Trump tried to pressure Brad Raffensperger, who was the Georgia Secretary of State, to find 11,000 votes, which, as I mentioned, would have just so happened to have put him over the top. 
And to me, why I find this revealing and troubling is it seems like it stems not from a good faith motivation to make sure the election was fair or to try to uh, investigate instances of suspected voter fraud, which I believe the state actually did do several times and, and was controlled by Republicans, uh, but an effort to try to use the tools of the state to overturn the election and quote unquote, find votes, uh, which to me uh, seems like a real degradation of the integrity of the vote. How do you see that specific instance? Well, I'll first say I think the integrity of the vote is is one of the most important things that we have to look at in this country as the bedrock of our republic. It's it's one of the things that we have to have confidence in if we are to continue this great experiment, right? So now, if in fact Trump was asking somebody to find votes that did not exist, I am 100% in opposition to that, 100%. There, there's no question about it. And I think most, most conservatives, most Americans would agree with me. We do not want anybody to find votes that do not exist. Was that what he was asking to do? If that's what he was asking to do, I'm 100% in opposition to what he was asking. And, and I will go with that. You know, as far as if that was his intention, I really can't say, but uh, that's about all I got to say about that. <laughs> mm. For me, it is hard for me to see Donald Trump accepting the results of any election in which he is not the winner. Even in 2016, when he won uh, the Electoral College, he made a series of baseless claims that he had actually won the popular vote, uh, which, um, you know, the 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 count showed he'd he'd won he'd lost, uh, excuse me, by a few millions. Um, you know, and in a in a way, it's funny. I think people will say, "Oh, that's Trump being Trump," uh, and I get that, but it's also quite serious because it's a man willing to say things that are untrue because he does not want to accept a result that makes him look like a loser, even if it's in the popular vote or, and what have you. And even going into the 2020 election before the election, he was, I think, kind of priming the pump in a way to say, they're going to try to steal it from me. They're going to try to steal it from me. Uh, and I think that's it's it's really insidious and, and dangerous because I think it undermines people's trust in uh, the integrity of the vote. And I see that, again, as something that's separate from, you know, good faith. Let's get to the bottom. Let's make the vote secure. Let's let's protect the vote. How do you see that kind of rhetoric? I see Donald Trump as a showman. That's that's what he is. That's what he's always been. Um, that is in, in some way part of his strength in what he gets done. Just like any salesman, any, anybody that is out there using themselves as a product to sell, they are going to be bombastic. They are going to inflate uh, certain things about themselves to, to sell the product. Um, I, I can tell you that I am not a fan of the way that he tries to sell himself. I'm not a fan of the way he inflates certain things, whether it be the number of votes he received or the number of people that showed up at his inauguration or, you know, things like that. <clears throat> Do I think that it's insidious in a way that it undermines things, maybe in, in the eyes of some, uh, not in mine, uh, because I, I think that those things, in my mind, I look at them almost as irrelevant. Uh, the popular vote is not the way we elect president in this, in this country. So the popular vote means very little to me. And when I look at a when I look at things uh, on a 
um, macro scale and see somebody conflating uh, or, or inflating numbers like the popular vote just to maybe pimp their own ego a little bit. It, it really, in, in the grand scheme of things, it, it doesn't doesn't do anything for me. It's 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 like somebody talking about the uh, uh, you know the size of the tires on their car and and how that that makes their car so much cooler. It, it does nothing for me. It, it really I don't care. Um, what really matters is the electoral college and. As somebody who believes in the Electoral College and what it stands for, why it was uh, originally imposed, it makes a lot of sense. If he wants to, you know, inflate his own ego a little bit by talking about the popular vote, not a not a not a thing that I'm going to waste any time thinking about or or worry about. Period. Hmm. Well, I think that's a good segue the electoral college into the other investigation that trump is facing which is around january 6th trump famously tried to do everything he could to get mike pence to refuse to certify the electors from the electoral college uh sort of a last ditch effort to hold up the certification process what was your reaction to that one it, you know, I, I suppose some of the things that he said were a little over the top. Um, I, I don't believe for a second anything that he said uh, did anything to incite the violence and, and the, the, the nonsense that we saw on January 6th. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I think he was doing what the showman Donald Trump does, and he was just speak in his mind the way that he he does so often and uh yeah I, I and I'm thankful for for Mike Pence doing uh, what Mike Pence did Mike Pence did the job that he was supposed to do um I I don't think just like just like I don't like the unprecedented event that happened earlier this week where a former president's um estate was was raided by the FBI I also would not have liked an unprecedented event where a um, a an election was overturned by the will of, or or the will of the people was overturned. Now, I'm not a fan of what happened on the 2020 election. I do not. Um, I cannot get my mind around the idea that 81 million people voted for Joe Biden. But I also, unless there was overwhelming evidence to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that election did not happen lawfully, I do not think that it would have been the right move for the vice president of the United States, being Mike Pence at the time, to not certify the election. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's been a number of things that have happened over the past several years that have caused people to lose faith in our federal government and our government processes when it comes to our elected officials, I think that would have been one more that, that would have caused much more problems than even this uh, dog and pony show that the, the January 6th commission has turned out to be. So, um, yeah, quite honestly, I, I think I think things happen the way that they needed to happen. Um, I, I think Donald Trump uh, expecting or hoping that Mike Pence would uh, not certify the election and, and to drag it out and turn it into something that it didn't need to be um, would have been bad. It would have been catastrophic for for the Republicans or for the Republic, not not the Republicans necessarily, but for everybody. All, all Americans. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there would have been a true constitutional crisis because on January 20th, 14 days later, you know, the new president is supposed to be inaugurated. But constitutionally, without that certification, there would have been two per, two men claiming to be president. And uh, it's 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 scary to think about how that would have played out. And I think uh, 
Mike Pence ultimately took his oath to the Constitution seriously, and he and his lawyers reviewed it, and he told President Trump, I can't do what you're asking me to do. And I think he showed a lot of resolve in that moment, particularly when you think about the fact that there were a bunch of people trying to overrun the Capitol, allegedly chanting, uh, hang Mike Pence. And, uh, you know, I, I think as part of some of the January 6th hearings, they released some of the, you know, Secret Service conversation about that day and really quite, quite scary. So my last question before we move on from Trump and these investigations, if Trump does get indicted for one of these things, and if he does get convicted by a jury of his peers, as our legal system is set up to do, do you think that he still should run for president? And would you still support him if he wins the election, conviction be damned, retake office? I will say this about Trump when it comes to uh, his chances in the 2024 election and, and whether I would support him or not. Um, Donald Trump, if he becomes the nominee for the Republican Party in 2024, I will again vote for Donald Trump. And I will do so because I don't think there is any greater threat to our nation than what the Democrat Party has been doing to our country. So if my dog was running against Joe Biden in 2024, if in fact Joe Biden's the Democrat nominee in 2024, which I highly doubt anyway, but it really doesn't matter at this point because he's just a figurehead, in my opinion. I would vote for my dog because there's really... <laughs> There's really nothing nothing good that's coming out of, of the current administration. It, it's an absolute nightmare. So um, with, with the prospect of Donald Trump becoming the nominee again, I would, I would yes, I, I would support Donald Trump uh, if he's the Republican nominee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, with that said, um, I, I think there are, uh, are much better prospects in the uh, in the Republican field that that I would like more. But mm -hmm. uh, again, if if he's the nominee, I, I understand how our our political system works, and uh, that would mean that in order to remove the threat that I see the Democrat Party being, I would yes, I, I would conviction be damned I, it wouldn't matter to me um you know because while i don't like the personality of trump while i don't like the way that he acts and some of the things that he says and certainly the things that he tweets um i, I do believe he governed very well and did some incredible things for the country so uh i'm just not a politics of personality kind of person i'm a politics of reality and, and what that person and, and the kind of administration they can put together would put together for the country. And uh, if we had another four years, um, minus all the insanity that came along with uh, uh, with the witch hunts and, and whatnot during the, the four years of the, the, the Donald Trump presidency, um, if we could have that same administration over again and, and do for the country what that administration was able to do, I think the country would be much, much better off. Conviction be damned. Hmm. And so what is it that repels you or scares you about the Democrats and Joe Biden and the left? Oh, well, I, I think if we look at our public education system, I think if we look at um, the, the different things that are going on in much of our major cities uh, today with uh, the crime and, and, and the different things, if we look at uh, inflation, uh, first of all, the economy. I, I mean, we can't we can't 
do anything right now without looking at the economy and, and, and seeing what the economy is, has done. Um, you know, everything that I do, Kieran, I, I do first and foremost, looking through the lens of liberty, looking through the lens of personal accountability and, and, and personal uh, liberty. Um, as a party that is set on increasing the size of government, increasing government spending, uh, a cradle to grave kind of mentality that stands against everything that I stand for. Um, I want personal accountability. They want cradle to grave government coddling. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just, that's the biggest thing for me. It's not, it's not that I fear anything so much as the Democrat party today does not conform to what the founders believed in when they talked about liberty, e pluribus unum, in God we trust. Everything that I stand for, in many ways, they stand against. And that's that's really the, the gist of it. Hmm. Well, you mentioned the Republican primary and the fact that some folks who voted for Trump might have recently been drifting away from him. And I think recently you've heard a lot of folks on the right talk about Ron DeSantis really positively. What do you think about DeSantis and how would you see kind of an open primary playing out? Because I remember in 2016, Trump took up all the oxygen in the room and he came up with uh, all those names for his opponents, low energy, Jeb, little Marco, et cetera. You know, I wonder what kind of name he would choose for Ron DeSantis. But do you think any of the folks in the Republican field are strong enough to stand up to Trump and defeat the still significant base of support that he has? I would like to think so, but but you make an excellent point. I, I mean, he did take all the air out of the room. He did. Um, he was a phenomenon. And, and like I said, that phenomenon was built uh, in large part because of what the Democrats had been doing for so many years. And when it finally came down to it, Trump was the one person that didn't say, I'm going to go along to get along. I'm going to go in there and fight like it's the fight of my life. And he started saying and doing things that the vast majority of politicians in the history of this country have never done, especially politicians on the Republican side. Um, Democrats have always been a, if, if they go low, we're going to go lower. And Republicans have been, we're going to take the high road and hope for the best. And people didn't want to see that anymore. Um, if it came down to Republican primary, you know, I, I didn't, I did not like Trump uh, during the primaries uh, at, at all. Uh, the way he conducted himself, the way he acted towards towards the other candidates, the other thing. But again, that's what it took to get the job done because that's what people wanted to see. They wanted to see somebody that was going to fight and be as nasty as a Harry Reid and a Nancy Pelosi and and, and the 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 vitriolic, venomous things that Democrats have been saying about Republicans for years, people didn't want a go along, get along person like Mitt Romney uh, to be in there anymore. They, they, they knew that that wasn't going to get the job done. So when I talk about that Leviathan of, uh, of Trump publicans, that was built based on the vitriol coming out of the left. And, and they, and, and so many people that were just never in the political arena before and when I say the political arena, I mean people that hadn't voted before, people that didn't want anything to do with politics, people that just wanted to be left alone. They only got involved because they knew that if they didn't get involved, they were going to continue to lose, and they were going to continue to see somebody like like Barack Obama coming in and 
and, and telling them uh, that they were stupid and, and treating them like like the country or treating their country like it was the the problem of all the world. And, and they didn't want to see it anymore. And they knew that the only way to beat that machine was with somebody who was going to be the same kind of uh, vitriolic, venomous person. And that's why Trump ended up getting where Trump got. I would hope that people will start to come around and see that that is not necessary, but whether whether that same kind of thing would happen uh, in in a in a primary between Iran DeSantis and a Donald Trump, I don't know. I would hope not, but um, I, I think Ron DeSantis has has uh, has enough. Uh, I don't even know what the word I want to use is. I, I think he's he's strong enough to handle himself and take care of himself. I mean, he's uh, he's definitely uh, he's definitely got the uh, got the got the legs and the armament for battle. So, mm. well, it'll definitely be interesting. And if Joe Biden decides not to run for president, and there's a Democratic open primary. Are there any Democratic figures that I guess you would find to be the the least of the worst or any folks that you think you could find some common ground with? Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard. I, I yeah, I, I think uh I think Tulsi Gabbard is a is a phenomenal figure. I don't I don't agree with her on many things, but uh, uh, but as far as somebody who who has appeal, she's got some very very strong classic liberal ideas. Um, she she certainly loves her country. She doesn't uh, she doesn't believe in the the constant apology and blame America uh, playbook that that so many Democrats do nowadays. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would seriously like to see Tulsi Gabbard get back in the mix, um, and I think that's what the Democrat Party needs. I mean, right now, um, right, right now, it's it's turned into a it's turned into this this let's appease the 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 most left of the left wing kind of nightmare scenario, you know in the democrat party and and it's just not where the country is and it's not where the country needs to be um so so yeah if i had to pick anybody i would pick tulsi gabbard hmm. yeah my impression of tulsi gabbard is that she's taken a pretty hard right turn since the 2020 elections i mean if you follow her twitter it's sort of hard to distinguish her rhetoric from partisan republicans so I'm not quite sure if she would still identify as a Democrat or run again, but certainly she brings uh, views into the mix that you don't find elsewhere uh, within the Democratic Party. I guess my last question is sort of a broader one about the work that we do together. Brave Angels has really been focused since its birth on bringing ordinary folks together at the grassroots level. But obviously, we're you know a couple months out from a midterm election, and then things are going to be really heating up. How do you see Braver Angels' role in the larger political scene? And do you think the methods that we found to be effective working with people at the grassroots can also be effective in the political world? Or do you see those two things as fundamentally different things? I don't think they are fundamentally different. I think they're vitally important, to be honest, um, which is one of the reasons like with the We the People's Project, I want to figure out a way to scale the conversations that we have and bring them down to local levels and, and get local politicians involved again. Because Kieran, I'll tell you right now, this country, if we do not get back to the mentality of the government that governs closest, governs best, 
and get away from the concept of everything needs to be dictated by Washington, D.C. and those in the bubble of the Beltway, we will not win. We will not survive as a country. So people, everyday Americans, everyday working class Americans, truck drivers, plumbers, HVAC technicians, contractors, um, you know, grocery store workers, all these people need to get involved at a local level and demand more from their local politicians. They need to get in there. They need to have the conversations, demand that those local politicians have the conversations with them. And then as a representative republic, they scale. The local politicians can then scale that up to people above them and, and just make sure that people are getting involved again in local politics. And then as people or as the politicians in the in the beltway bubble and 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 your state capitals and things like that start to see people getting involved at a local level they are going to start to respond in kind to what people actually want instead of the people just having to cow down to or, or bow down or whatever to the whims of these people that see themselves as kings of little countries so, so yeah, I absolutely think that the Braver Angels model and the Braver Politics concept and, and bringing it to the people and getting people involved again is vitally important to the future of our country. Hmm. And do you think there are instances in which it's justified for the federal government to overrule, you know, local governments and counties and municipalities? Yes, I, I believe that there are in in very rare instances, but just as uh, just as the Constitution says, any power that's not granted specifically to the federal government in the Constitution is reserved to the states, respectively. You know, and when it comes to certain things like civil rights and and things like that, if the federal government sees that there are local governments that are impeding on people's individual rights and, and individual liberties? Absolutely. The federal government does need to get involved at that point. The federal government's primary responsibility in this country is to protect the individual from undue force and fraud. That undue force and fraud, if it is imposed by a local government entity, absolutely, the federal government has a responsibility. It is their duty to go in and protect that individual. But other than that, no, they shouldn't be uh, interfering in, in local matters. Mm. And what about when it comes to guaranteeing basic services? I'm thinking about, you know, certain issues like health care. Do you think the federal government should be able to regulate, you know, pharmaceutical prices if you have a drug company that's charging you know two hundred dollars for insulin or something like that things that you know local governments don't really have the power or capability to do only the federal government can really step in how do you sort of navigate those kind of things where it gets a little more complicated the federal government imposing price controls has never, ever in the history of this country turned out well for anybody. Um, now, there are certain things that I, I, I think, um, you know, certain patent laws that we have and, and things where where um, pharmaceutical companies, if, if uh, you know, it, and this isn't something that I, I know a lot about, I, you know, truck driver and I manage truck drivers. So, so I don't know a lot about patent laws or things like that, but I, I do know that there are certain regulations that have proved uh, to serve the people very well. And that, and that when, you know, they, they, they are granted a patent that holds up for so long in order for them to recoup the costs of their, um, their design and, and their research and, and stuff like that, you know, and, and I think that those things have done very well. Um, but yeah, I, I think one of the great things about our country is the fact that we have been able to, through the help of, of people like like the NIH and, and stuff like that, develop drugs and, and, and vaccines and, and things like that 
that have helped the the, the American people and and done so very very well. Um, so there are certain things that I I do agree. Just like having conversations with my friend Dr. Francis Collins, who has you know ran the NIH for so long, like he said, there are certain things that are just not you know sexy enough that the uh, market is going to pay for them up front. So, you know, the government does have to get involved in certain things when it comes to research and and, and design and and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I think there is a role there. I think where that, that role becomes overstepped is when the government, especially the federal government, but when the government starts to get involved in that doctor-patient relationship and gets involved in like the Affordable Care Act, Act did and, and make so much more administrative and, and bureaucratic garbage that has imposed different controls and different things on, on the on the healthcare industry and really stepped in and put a wedge in between the individual healthcare provider and the individual American. So so there's things right there that that have really become bothersome. But yeah, I definitely, I think they play a role. I think there is a lot of, um, a, a lot of strength in the term common good when it comes to things like healthcare and things like the the public interstate system and and things like, you know, the, um, the federal DOT and, and certain things. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not an anti-government kind of, or, you know, anti-government person, but I'm an anti-big government person. And just as I just as I stated in a conversation earlier this week with my new friend, Dr. Jerome Adams, um, if the government starts to try to do too many things, they quit doing anything well. So, mm. you know, as they become more and more entrenched in more and more things in our lives, more of what they're doing, they do very poorly and things that are, are important start to get underfunded. Like uh, you know the the individual state healthcare systems and, and different things like that. So, so there is a you know it, it's a very complex issue, but in in so many ways the federal government especially is involved in far too many things and they do very few things well at this point, especially under this administration. But very few things well in general. Mm. Well, the last thing I want to ask you about while I have you is uh, your podcast. Tell us a little bit more about Derate the Hate and what you hope to accomplish. Derate the Hate podcast is all about bettering the world one attitude at a time. It really starts with uh, gratitude and personal accountability and, and people's mindset. You know, there's only one good thing about a bad attitude, and that's we as individuals have the ability to change it. So when it really comes down to everything that we have, everything that happens in our life, we can't control everything that happens, but we can control how we react to it. So the D-Rate Day podcast is really just about bettering attitudes, talking to different people, finding out, you know, having conversations, everyday conversations with other people that are trying to better the world and, uh, and, and, and using that as a tool for each of us as an individual to make better choices live better lives and do do better things for the world around us. Because if we all as individuals better our own attitudes, the world is the world around us just naturally becomes a better place. So that's mm. what it's all about, bettering the world one attitude at a time. That's beautifully said. And I would encourage all of our listeners to check out deratethehate.com and also let us know what you thought of this conversation. This is a public conversation. It's an open dialogue. You know, we want folks from the far left to the far right to feel like they can come to Braver Angels and express themselves freely and fully. And we'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email at media at braverangels.org, and we will see you next time.